In this video, I would like to talk to you about something called optimization. Now, to a certain extent, we have already been doing optimization uh, yesterday and the previous day when we practiced techniques that would help us to find local maxes, local mins, global maxes, and global mins for a function. Today, we're going to focus on a special situation which is called constrained optimization, where you're trying to maximize or minimize a function but there are some limitations or some restrictions on the things that you can do in that scenario. For a quick example, and I'm going to be, I will admit, using a lot of sort of DIY examples. So suppose that I have a DIY project and I'm trying to build a rectangular raised garden bed of the largest possible size. I want to absolutely stuff this thing full of potatoes, for example. Now, this in and of itself is not really a well-posed problem because realistically, in addition to trying to make the largest possible potato garden bed, there are going to be some restrictions or limitations involved that, that keep me from building a garden bed as large as the United States itself. I'm either going to have limitations in terms of my property size or limitations in terms of how much resources that I have to build the bed or limitations in terms of how much money I have, something like that. So anytime we're trying to optimize something realistically, there are some constraints. There are some restrictions which limit what we are actually able to do. And in a constrained optimization problem, we have some quantity we're trying to find either the global maximum or the global minimum of a function which represents that quantity, but we also have at least one other equation in there called the constraint equation, which represents any limitations on what we're able to do. For example, suppose that I'm trying to build this raised rectangular garden bed, but I don't actually want to spend any more money making this happen. I'm gonna to try to use lumber only that is left over from whatever other DIY project that I was working on. Now, I count up how much lumber I have, measure it, and it turns out that I have enough to build a bed that has a perimeter of 32 feet. So, that being said, how should I build this garden? In order to maximize the area. So the first thing that we do in problems like this, constrained optimization, is to write down what's called the objective function. The objective function represents the quantity that we're trying to either maximize or minimize. Now in this case, we're trying to maximize the area of this rectangular garden bed. This rectangular garden bed is going to have some length and some width and the quantity that I'm trying to maximize, the objective function is the area function, which currently is in terms of both length and width. The area of a rectangle is length times width. So now that I've written down the objective function, the thing that I'm trying to maximize, let me write down the constraint equation. This is the equation that represents any limitations on what we're actually able to do. So in this situation, the constraint is imposed by the fact that I'm being a little bit cheap and I don't want to buy any more lumber. And I only want to use leftover lumber, which is only enough to build a rectangle with a perimeter of 32 feet. So using the perimeter equation, the perimeter, two times the length plus the width, cannot exceed the 32 feet that I have left over. Okay, so now that I've established the objective function and the constraint, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the constraint equation and isolate one of the two variables in the equation. So, for example, I might decide I'm going to isolate L. So I can start by dividing both sides by 2, and then I can subtract W, and I get L equals 16 take away W. 
So I took the constraint equation and I isolated the variable called L. Now in the next step, let's substitute the result of step one back into the objective function. Notice that right now, our objective function is a function with two input variables, both L and W. And as of this moment, we really are not aware of any techniques to take the derivative of a function of two variables. Y'all are going to have to take my Calculus 4 class for that. So right now, in order to use all these tools, first derivative test, second derivative test, critical points, whatever, before we can even unlock the ability to use those tests, we need to take this function of two variables and change it to a function of one variable. And that is what step three is designed to accomplish. Step three says, we now know that as a result of the constraint, that the length must be equal to 16, take away the width. So now we have our area function. In terms of a single variable, we remove L, we put 16 minus W into its position. And now we have area as a function of W alone. Beautiful. Once we have area as a function of W alone, we can maximize the area using the techniques that we've studied up to this point. Let's find the global max slash global min of the objective function from step number three. Area as a function only of the width. Now the first thing that we should really ask ourselves is, are we guaranteed to actually find a maximum to this function? We've seen examples of functions that don't have global maxes or global mins. Will this function have one or not? What saves us is the fact that realistically, the, function, the variable w can only take on values in a pretty limited range. First of all, width can't be lower than zero. You can't have a negative width. But in this particular setting, if I only have enough lumber to construct a perimeter of 32, there's an upper limit on the width as well. The width couldn't exceed 16. Because if you have 16 for one width and 16 for another, your, your 32 units of lumber have already been used up. So we're trying to find the global maximum, in our case, of the function a of w on a closed interval from 0 to 16, which means that a global maximum is guaranteed to exist on this interval. So where can the global maximum, in this case the maximum area, be found? There are only three possible locations at any critical points of the function and at the two endpoints. So let's start by listing out the critical points. Uh, in service of finding a prime, I think it might be more convenient if we rewrite a of w as 16w minus w squared. That way we can just use the sum and difference rule. Now this quantity is already defined, so let's set this equal to zero. And that tells me that the critical point is located at w equals eight. So there are only three possible locations for the global maximum area. The critical point at w equals 8, the end point at w equals 0, and the end point at w equals 16. How will we tell which one of these gives us the global maximum area? The easiest and most reliable way, in my opinion, is just to plug all three values into a of w 
and figure out which one gives us the biggest area. So A evaluated at 8 is equal to 16 minus 8 times 8, looks like 64. A evaluated at 0 is 0, and it turns out that A evaluated at 16 is also equal to 0. So the global max is located at W equals 8, and these two endpoints correspond to a global min in this situation. So if I want to not spend any money, only use leftover resources from another project, but still build a bed that can fill as many potatoes as my heart desires, I should draw it so I should build it so that the width is eight units, probably feet. The length is 16 take away eight units. And for that, all that I'm doing is I'm using the fact that the length was equal to 16 minus the width. So I'm building a square rectangular garden, eight feet by eight feet. This will use up all the lumber, giving me a perimeter of exactly 32 feet, and it will have the largest possible area of 64 square feet. Ooh, that's a lot of potatoes. Let's try another example. So in this situation, I'm building an artificial pond slash pool slash water feature in the backyard, and I've decided to make it quite a large pond, big enough to hold approximately a cubic meter of water. Now, if I want the pond to have an approximately cylindrical shape, but I have absolutely no other aesthetic considerations at all, how should I build the pond in order to minimize the cost? In other words, I don't really care what it looks like in the end. All that I care is that it's as cheaply made as possible. Sam, please play the clip from that Netflix show that just came out, the one with the motel. Hey! Hi. Make your progress? So I got some bad news for you. This little project could go anywhere from 10 to 15,000. That's our entire budget. That's more and than more. <laughs> and more. There's no other option of ripping out. You could, but then you're still gonna open up this wall. What's the cheapest way we go? Now, while we're doing these calculations, they allow us to make a couple of assumptions. First of all, the bottom and the sides of this cylindrical water feature are made of the same material and are of the same thickness. So our goal in this situation is to minimize the cost. Unfortunately, in this scenario, we don't actually know what the building material in this problem actually is going to cost us. So in absence of that information, let's s settle for minimizing the surface area of the pond. If we minimize the surface area, then that will minimize the cost, independent of the actual building material that we choose and also independent on where we decide to buy that material and how much it costs us at that location. Our objective function then is going to be the surface area of this cylinder, cylinder which is missing its top, only bottom and sides. So the question is, what formula could we use to give us the surface area of this cylinder? So the first thing that I'm going to account for is the surface that is given to me by the bottom of the cylinder. The bottom of the cylinder is shaped like a circle. And if the cylinder has radius r, then the area of that circular base is going to be pi times the radius squared. Now what about the side of the cylinder? The sides of this cylinder can be found by first calculating the length of the rim, the circumference, in other words, of a circle of radius r, which is 2 times pi times r, and multiplying that by the cylinder's height. 
So our objective function, the thing that we are trying to minimize in this case, is currently a function of two variables, r and h. Now let's write down the constraint equation. And the constraint, the restriction, the limitation in this scenario is that I am requiring the pool to be big enough to hold a cubic meter of water. So I need the volume of this cylinder to be approximately one cubic meter. And if I use the formula for the volume of a cylinder, what I'm saying is that I need pi times the radius squared times the height to be equal to one cubic meter. So step two, let's isolate one of the variables in this constraint equation. And it looks to me like the one that will be easiest to isolate is this h here, because h doesn't have any exponents. So h would be equal to one divided by r squared. Now we can put that into our objective function and reduce our objective function to having one variable only. So pi r squared plus two pi r times what's now one over pi r squared. Let me go ahead and clean this up just a little bit and prepare to take the derivative of this function in the next step. We have pi r squared and then I'm going to rewrite this back term as 2, the pi's cancel out, one of the r's cancels, and I'm left with r to the minus 1. Representing the 1 over r, but I'm just writing it in a format that'll make it more conducive to the use of power rule. Before we jump into the nitty gritty of finding critical points, let's check and see if it's reasonable for us to expect or assume that a global minimum actually exists. Are there real world restrictions on the possible values of R? Now, as usual, a radius of real world physical dimension cannot be any smaller than zero. But looking at the problem, I'm not really seeing anything that would put a hard limit, a hard upper limit on the possible values of R. Of course, realistically, there would be some kind of restrictions on how large the radius of our pond could be. There would be some limitations on how much money we could spend. There would be some limitations on how much property we had that we could fill up. But none of those limitations have been provided to us in this calculation. So based solely on the information that we have and we know for sure, there's really no guaranteed upper limit on the possible values of the radius. So based only on the given data, we're not actually completely guaranteed that this function will achieve a global minimum anywhere. So we'll need to walk into this problem with our eyes open go ahead and we'll calculate the critical points of this function a of r but at the end of the problem i am going to check that critical point graphically and see if it's plausible that that is the actual global minimum so let's take a prime of r and a prime of r by power rule is 2 pi times r minus 2 r to the minus 2 or if you prefer you can rewrite this as 2 pi times r minus 2 over r squared. Now, unlike usual, there actually is a location where r prime is undefined. r prime is undefined where r is equal to 0. But realistically, we know that this 
location is not going to achieve our goals for this pond. A pond of radius zero, sure enough, will completely have zero cost to build, but it also will not hold any water. So this is going to violate our goal of holding one liter of water. So this value doesn't make sense in context. So let's go ahead and let's check out the locations where r prime of where a prime of r is equal to zero. If I go ahead and add that second term to both sides and then do a little bit of rearranging, then I get r cubed is equal to 1 divided by pi. Or in other words, r is equal to the cube root of 1 over pi. I'm just going to go ahead and approximate that to 0.68 meters. Why meters? because volume was given in terms of cubic meters. Now let's do some quick quality assurance and make sure that R equals 0.68 corresponds to an actual global minimum of the surface area function. So here I am on Desmos with the graph of our surface area function, pi R squared plus two over R. And we can see that this function does achieve a minimum here at 0.68. 8, 3, which is the same as the value of r that we estimated. Now at first glance, this may not seem like the minimum, the global minimum of this function, because we can see points that are lower than this on the left side of this picture. But note that none of these points are valid in our problem because they correspond to a negative radius. A more accurate representation of our situation would be given if we restrict the possible values of r to be greater than zero, because r is a physical dimension and cannot be negative. And it's looking like if we impose that perfectly reasonable restriction, that this time we can see yes, this point is a global minimum of this function if we allow ourselves only to consider positive r values. So I would say to myself, okay, with these criteria, how should I construct this cylindrical pond? I'm going to construct it so that it has a radius of about 0.68 meters. And what should the height be? In order to find the height, let's go back to our constraint equation. as it happens is almost exactly the same, uh, 0.69 meters. So disregarding any aesthetic considerations, thinking only about the cost. What's the cheapest way we go? If you want the pond to hold one cubic meter of water and you want to minimize the building materials and the expense, construct your cylindrical pond so that its radius and its height are approximately equal at about 0.68 meters. One more example. So suppose that we have a store which is selling wireless headphones at $210 each. Now if it prices the headphones at $210, the store finds that it generally sells about 100 sets of headphones per week. But if they make the headphones a bit cheaper, they sell more headphones. For each $10 discount that they offer to buyers, the number of headphones that they sell each week increases by five. So the question is, how large a discount should the store offer in order to maximize their revenue, the total amount of money that they bring into the company? So the objective is to maximize revenue. So our objective function should be a function that gives us the revenue. And our revenue is dependent on two things. Our revenue is dependent first on how many units of headphones we sell, 
and second, the price at which we actually sell them. So I'm going to call x units sold, and I'm going to call p the price. If I sell x units at a price of p dollars per unit, then the total amount of money brought in will be equal to x times p, the number of units sold times the price per unit. So our objective is to maximize the revenue, therefore our objective function is this revenue function. So what in this scenario represents our constraint? Well, the constraint in this scenario is given by the demand for the headphones. The constraint is represented by the fact that depending on how our headphones are priced, it either increases or decreases the demand for the headphones. Now it says that if we price our headphones at 210, then we sell 100 sets of headphones. So I might just make a quick note of that here, that price against units sold to 10 would correspond to 100. And it also says that for every 10% discount, so I'm going to say maybe something like the change in price, delta price, to evoke some chemistry notation. If I change the price by decreasing it by 10 units, then the units sold will increase by five units. So this seems like a prime opportunity to construct a linear equation between P and X. If, for example, I use P as the output variable and X as the input variable, then what we're saying is that we have a point where the input is 100 and the output is 210 and we have a slope where the rise, the change in the output, is given by negative 10. Over the run, the change in input is given by 5. So with those parameters, I would say that the relationship in the constraint is that if I take p minus 210, that is going to be equal to the slope times x minus 100, just using that point-slope formula. So now let's take this constraint equation and isolate one of the variables. At the moment, it looks like it's easiest to isolate the price. So I would write this as P equals, I would simplify this to minus two, X minus 100 plus 210. And if you like, you can simplify this further. For example, P equals negative two X plus 200 plus 210 p equals negative 2x plus 410. Now let's take that constraint equation and let's substitute that back into the objective function. And we get that our revenue, now as a function of x only, is equal to x times p, where p has been replaced by negative 2x plus 410, which can be simplified to negative 2x squared plus 410 times x. Let's consider the possible values of the input x. First of all, it's not possible to sell a negative number of units, unless you're accepting refunds, which is something we're not considering. So x has a lower limit of zero. I think in this situation, x would also reasonably have an upper limit. The maximum number of units that you could move would correspond to the case where your price was equal to zero. You're basically giving your headphones away for free. So what happens to the X if the price is zero? What's the maximum number of units that you could sell? Let's see, negative 2X plus 400 equals zero, no price. Bond, I think to x equals 205. So even if you were giving your headphones away for zero dollars, you couldn't actually move any more than 205. Okay, 
so it is reasonable to expect that revenue will achieve a global maximum, either at a critical point or at one of the endpoints. Let me first of all quickly fix this typo. This should be 410 times x. And in the derivative, it will transform into negative 4x plus 410. This is always defined, so let's see where it is equal to 0. This is equal to 0 at negative 410 divided by negative 4, which is equal to 100 and I guess 2.5. Now, it doesn't really make sense to have half a pair of headphones, so I'm just going to round, basically just round down to the nearest whole number. Okay, now this is all well and good, but it might be more meaningful to think about the actual discount that we should offer customers in order to sell this number of headphones. So let's go back to that equation which related the price with the number of units sold. So according to this, the optimal price is not far off of the original price. Our revenue is maximized when the price is around $206. Now it is worth checking that this is the actual global maximum and that the actual global maximum is not achieved at one of the endpoints. So let's go ahead and determine for sure that the revenue is maximized at 102 as opposed to x equals 0 or x equals 205. But you can confirm that if you sell zero units of headphones, that your revenue is going to be zero. And you can confirm that if you are giving your headphones away for free, you're not making any money because you didn't charge anything. So the revenue then is maximized sort of in the middle of these two positions. The revenue is maximized when x is equal to 102 units sold at a price of $206. This will be the actual maximum revenue. This concludes today's material. We gave a four-step process that could be used to solve problems of constrained optimization. The first thing that you need to do is you need to identify what quantity you're trying to either minimize or maximize. This is called the objective function. And then you need to write down a formula for that quantity in mathematical terms. Now, oftentimes when you do this, that formula will be expressed in terms of two input variables, units sold and price, length and width, height and radius. That's where the constraint enters in. The constraint equation represents your limitations in the scenario and gives you a relationship between the different independent variables in your problem, which can be used to reduce the objective function to a function of one variable, which then you can maximize using calculus techniques.